Happy Father's Day. Uh, one of the things every father in the world has had an experience of is dealing with fussy children. So, um, you know, when we feed our kids spaghetti bolognese, you know, often the response is, I don't like mushrooms, or I don't like this meat, or I don't like garlic, or what's this little green parsley in it, or I don't like tomatoes. And if you listened to the kids as they were kind of complaining about their spaghetti bolognese, you'd end up with nothing but white pasta. And actually that's often what kids eat, just plain white pasta. And so often that's what many Christians eat spiritually. That's their diet. They purge Christianity of anything that is uncomfortable, challenging, or good for them. But if Christianity is true, then all of it must be true, even those difficult bits, which is why we're spending five weeks looking at what the Bible teaches us about the topic of sin. Yes, that's where we're going. And we've called this series ludicrous because sin is not just bad for us, it's it's not just damaging, it's also ludicrous. It makes no sense. And rather than this being a depressing series, I'm actually hoping that it'll help you laugh at yourself and run and be more amazed at the uh, redeeming grace of God. Each year, actually, we intentionally choose a little doctrinal series to spend time thinking about the Bible in greater depth to try and swing the pendulum away from that very sugary kind of Christianity that's out there where God is small and humans are big and where the gospel is stripped of all its power to confront and transform, where the gospel is purged of anything uncomfortable or good from it. Much of Christianity today is like white pasta, inoffensive, but having no nutritional value at all. And it's our design for this series actually to get us back. What does the Bible say about ourselves? Let's confront ourselves in the mirror and learn about what God has done about that. Now, last week we looked at how sin is lawlessness, that in essence, sin is not kind of just behavioral, it's attitudinal. And we saw that we're all in heart resist God being an authority over us, and we've become like pirates. That was the key metaphor. Today, we're thinking about how sin is a form of spiritual adultery. And there, if there's one book in the Bible that talks about this, it would be the book of Hosea. This whole book's given to this metaphor of us being like a woman that cheats on her husband. Hosea was a prophet who had a messed up marriage and God uses that to show us what his marriage to his people is like. Now, a number of years ago, I read a sermon by a wonderful preacher and stuck with me. He kind of showed how the story of Hosea teaches us that our relationship with God is like a marriage, that our relationship with God is like a broken marriage, and how God heals his broken marriage and what it actually costs him. And that's what the story of Hosea is about. And I thought those three things, they've still stuck with me over the years, and so I'm going to use those three ideas today in this sermon. So the first thing we're going to see is how our relationship with God is like a marriage. The story of Hosea is about a man who God tells to go love a woman who will be difficult to love. And we'll look at why it's difficult in a little moment. But the first thing we need to look at is why God asked Hosea to marry this woman. And it's because God is enacting the story of his love for his people of Israel, whom he likens to a bride. So if you've got a Bible, open up to Hosea chapter 3. And in verse 1, this is what we're told. The Lord said to me, Hosea, go show your love to your wife again. And then a little bit further, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. So here we see that this idea is that God loves the Israelites the way a husband loves his wife. And this idea of there being a marriage between God and his people is one of the dominant themes 
in the entire Bible. We see it all over the place. So in Isaiah chapter 54, we read, Don't be afraid, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Or Isaiah chapter 62 says, The Lord will take delight in you as a young man marries a young woman, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So in the Old Testament, God makes Israel his bride. And the New Testament, it is the church, which is the bride of Christ. And so Ephesians 5 says to husbands, if your husband, listen to this, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So throughout the Bible, one of the dominant metaphors that God uses to explain what our relationship with him is like is that of a man who'd do anything for his bride. And so to quote Tim Keller, he says, what this means is that if you're a Christian, you cannot understand your relationship with God strictly in terms of a king relating to his subjects or a shepherd relating to his sheep or a, <clears throat> even a father relating to his children, those metaphors don't tell you everything about what God wants in a relationship. He says, I'm not just a shepherd, a king, a father. I'm also your husband. And that's how he personally relates to us. And before we come back to Hosea, let me apply this to us because we, we really need to just let this sink in. What this means, maybe three things is, it means, first of all, that our relationship with God takes priority. Now, we have a funny game in our family where our, king, our kids keep debating who, uh, who my favourite is and who Liz's favourite is. And they're always like, Archer's the golden boy, he's the favourite. And then sometimes they ask, said, who's your favourite? And they kind of debate Evie's favourite is me and uh, Archer's favourite is Liz and Maisie's favourite is herself. <laughs> no, that's too mean. But, uh, but um, you know, sometimes I say, I do have a favourite. My favourite person is Liz, my wife. And, um, and Liz, you know, after God, Liz is number one priority in my life. Nothing comes before her. Even my children shouldn't. There is nothing better, if you're a parent, there's nothing better for your kids than to know that dad loves mom and that mom respects dad even more than they love their kids. So on this Father's Day, maybe the, the biggest gift you can give your kids is to romance your husband, wives, and for husbands to romance their wives. But if marriage is the metaphor for our relationship with God, then God's saying nothing should come before him in our lives. He's the priority. But secondly, not only is he the priority, then secondly, our relationship with God, it's deeply personal. Marriage is one of the most deeply personal relationships you can find yourself in. You can hide stuff from your parents. You can hide stuff from your friends. You can even hide stuff from yourself. But not much escapes your spouse. They know you. And if you want a good relationship with your spouse, they've got to know you personally, not from afar. Distance is dangerous in marriage. You can't just be going through the motions and ignore conflict. You can't hide what you're thinking or feeling. You can't hold back. You need to step in. And some of those who are watching in marriage, you're avoiders. You're conflict avoiders and you're like a little turtle that gets back in. And that's bad for marriage. You need to come out and talk. Now, some of you are sharks and rhinos and you charge in and you need to not do that as well. But we, a healthy relationship, you've got to nut things out. You've got to reveal who you are. You've got to step in and talk about what's annoying you. You've got to share your fears, dreams, hopes, nightmares, joys, and sorrows. If you're married and you're not doing that, well, welcome to the party. <laughs> we all struggle, but you should get help. But ultimately, you need to do that with God. He's saying, hey, marriage is a metaphor for your relationship with me because you can't know me from a distance. You can't know me impersonally. You can't just kind of rock up on Sunday and tune in to a, a sermon and think, oh, that's interesting. No, you need to know him personally. And there needs to be a sense of love on your heart. Have you lost your first love? Have you forgotten 
that Christianity, it's personal. You know, I like what J.I. Packer famously said, that you ought to get up every morning and look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a child of God. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day closer. Every Christian is a, my brother or sister too. Our relationship with God, it's deeply personal. And then thirdly, third little bit of application before we come back to the story is that uh, our relationship with God, it's powerful. Marriage, because it is personal and because they're your priority and you're their first priority, it has tremendous power to change your life. And here's why. You know, personally, I know that if my marriage is strong, if I'm assured of Liz's love for me, then everything else in my life can be a mess. And I can cope with that. I can move out into the world confident. But if my marriage is weak and everything, in, everything else in the rest of my life is going fine, it kind of doesn't matter. I'm, debil I'm debilitated and I move out into the world in weakness. Marriage is a relationship that wields enormous power. And some of you are saying, yeah, I know. And I'm going crazy because I'm single and I'd love to be married. But let's be realistic, human marriage, it's always a mix of both of those, the life changing and the life destroying. But there is a marriage and a husband who will never let you down, whose love will never fail you. And you have that if you follow Jesus. That's what God's saying through the prophet Hosea. Marriage is a metaphor for our relationship. It's powerfully enriching life-changing, has massive power to transform your view of life so that if things are right between you and God, you can actually go out into life when life's a mess and you have a power to, to kind of face that. And, you know, it's interesting, as you read the New Testament, Peter, the, the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, they're writing to churches where there's sickness, there's persecution, there's hardship, there's famine, there's trials. And I actually can't remember a time when, when those guys, they write to the church and say, hey, we're praying that God would lift you out of this situation. Almost every time these guys write to the church, he says, we're praying that you might have a sense of God's love on your heart. And I wonder, is that the way we pray for each other? more than God removing us from difficult life situations, that we would have a sense of God's love on our hearts because we can face anything. You'd be able to face anything if you had that. I'll give you another example. You know, if the, if the world says you're a fool, but your spouse says and really thinks you're insightful and they mean it, then you will feel wise. But if your wife says you're a fool, doesn't matter how much the world's saying, gee, that Toby Neal guy's insightful, you're gonna feel like a fool. Your spouse has that kind of power over you. Their love, their affirmation has that kind of power to change you, to heal you. And God's saying, that's what your relationship with me ought to be like. It's a marriage. That's the first thing we see in Hosea. Okay, let's come back to Hosea. There's extended application. Come back to Hosea because the second thing we see here is that our relationship with God, it's not just like a marriage, it's actually like a bad marriage. So um, if you come back to Hosea 3 verse 1, this is what it says. The Lord said to me, Hosea, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and, in, and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites though they turn to other gods. Show your, show your love to your wife again. Now, what's with that word again? Well, it's because Hosea loved a woman who left him and became an adulterous woman and started living with another man. Love your wife again. It's actually a reference to chapter one. So if you come back to Hosea chapter one, here we see kind of the whole story of what happens with Hosea and his wife, Gomer. So Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, this is what we read. 
When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So probably not the woman that Hosea would have hoped God had chosen for him. God says, see this woman over here, she's promiscuous. She's not gonna change. But Hosea, I want you to marry her. Now that's interesting, isn't it? God tells Hosea, hey, here's the woman I want you to marry. I want you to know, even before you marry her, I'm telling you about her, she's promiscuous. I want you to know, even before you marry her, that she's going to absolutely break your heart. She's going to trample on your heart and she's going to betray you and she's going to be unfaithful to you. And it's going to be incredibly painful for you but I want you to marry her now why would God ask him to marry a woman like this why would God put him through this kind of situation well he tells Hosea why verse 2 go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her for like an adulterous wife this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. God is saying that my wife, Israel, is guilty of the most awful adultery. They've departed from me. I married her and she cheated on me. I've been faithful to her over and over and over again, but she has been unfaithful to me. You see, the prophet Ezekiel, Jeremiah and Isaiah, they've told people how God is like a spurned lover whose wife cheats on him, betrays him and abandons him. Like the rest of the prophets, they use this metaphor. Uh, God's wife, his people have cheated on him and whored after other lovers. But God is this kind of turning point in the history of Israel at this point. It's as though God looks at the metaphor and he goes this isn't enough and so he says to Hosea I want you to live through what I've lived through don't just tell Israel what they're doing show them live it they won't understand who I am and who they are until they see it you won't understand sin and grace and understand my love and your fickleness until you see the experience of a man loving a woman who betrays him again and again and again. Jose, you're going to have to go through what I go through. Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. And so, verse 3, he married Goma, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. In fact, they had three children, two sons and a daughter. And, you know, the third child is named Loami, which means not mine. So heartbreaking. I mean, every time he's reading his kid a story at night and calls him by name, he's calling his kid not mine. He's reminded of his wife's unfaithfulness. What a terrible, terrible story. And so Hosea marries Goma. They have kids. And then later, after she has the third kid, she leaves him and moves in with a lover. And in chapter two, we kind of, it's a little bit tricky to piece together what's going on, but the first lover fails to provide for Goma. She, she shacks up with this guy. He's abusive. She doesn't have enough food or to eat money to live on and so Hosea comes and provides money to her lover so that she could be provided for it's incredible Goma doesn't even know that he's still funding her lifestyle she thinks it's her lover looking after her but in fact it's Hosea who hasn't given up on her and um, she moves around, she leaves that lover, she goes from lover to lover and eventually she becomes a prostitute. It's tragic, it's an awful story. She really falls, rejection after rejection, and, and, but then it even gets worse. At the start of chapter three, she's up for sale. And how did that happen? Well, we're not told, but there's a couple of ways it could happen. 
Uh, it's very possible that her lover has put her up for sale. Either she's fallen into debt, and that's one of the reasons she gets sold into slavery, or it could have been that he was a pimp and she had lost her marketability and he was cutting her losses, his losses. Or it could have been that she'd fallen into sexual slavery as a temple prostitute and she's got a lover on the side, but the temple's now selling her. We're not too sure, it's bad, whatever the case, and it's incredibly sad. And it's as far down as a person can go. It's as bad as it can be, and she's as lost as a person can be, as broken and enslaved and miserable. So there's Hosea's really bad marriage, and God says this is an image of what my relationship with my people is like. God is like a man whose, whose wife chooses to leave and move in with other men and they mistreat her and they abuse her and she doesn't have enough to live on and yet God keeps providing for us and we're adulterous and in, and in the end we become enslaved to that which we thought would love us but it destroys us. God loves you like that. It's incredible. And God wants us to know that when we sin against him, it's, we're actually committing spiritual adultery. We are Goma. And God is like Hosea. Now, some of you will question, I guess, the gendered nature of this. Why is God choosing to use an illustration where the woman is the sinner and the man is the innocent, godlike person? Oh, there we go. The patriarchy, the Bible, whatever. But Actually, this isn't routinely how the Bible portrays men and women. No, usually it's the opposite. If you read the Gospel of Luke, in fact, there are lots of men who are cast as villains in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, they're the ones that kill him, but there's not a single woman who's cast in a negative light in Luke's Gospel. The Bible, but the Bible does teach that Jesus came to save sinners who are both men and women and so sometimes it uses men as the example of sinners needing redemption and sometimes women and this is one of those rare moments where the woman is the example of the sinner so there's a little bit of an aside and so God is saying to Hosea hey your bad marriage your betrayal when your wife goes and puts herself in the arms of her lovers that's exactly what happens when I love my people and they put themselves in the arms of the people or the things that they love. That's what sin is. I wonder if you've ever thought of sin in terms of that. Hosea is telling us that the nature of sin is not just breaking God's commands, it's breaking God's heart. Most people have an anemic view of sin and they end up with a white pastor um, view of God's love. Uh, not nutritious and inoffen inoffensive, but not nutritious. Now, how do you understand God's love in light of your sin? You, know, you see, when a king sees a citizen breaking a rule, that makes him angry. When a shepherd sees a sheep straying, he says, oh, that's just sheep. When a father sees his child disobeying him, he says, I must discipline. But when the person you love most in life is putting themselves into the arms of, their, of another lover, that's different, isn't it? God says, until you understand this, you don't understand who you are and what's damaging you on the inside. You don't understand your sin as you should, and you won't understand the depth of my love. I think... Um, a friend of mine on the Central Coast, he picks up on this really well and he, he, he talks about the difference between a legal paradigm and a relational paradigm. And if, um, if the idea of pirate, that illustration was helpful last week, this, this illustration may help us this week. You know, a legal paradigm is where you operate from a sense of what is that there is a law that I'm called to obey and, in a, and maybe I break it or maybe I don't. So here's an example of a legal paradigm at work. You know, in the middle of summer, maybe it's Australia Day, you go down to the beach and you're there with mates. I mean, hopefully we can do this in summer. And you're there with mates and you've brought a six pack of beer or a bottle of wine. You just want to share 
glass of wine or a beer with some mates, you've been for a swim, you come back, you sit down on the lawn, you're at Bronte, uh, it's beautiful, sunshine, you just want to have a beer with mates, it's Australia Day, but you look up and there's a sign from Waverley Council or whoever it is saying no alcohol, alcohol pro pro is prohibited. And you're like, what? It's middle of summer. And, um, and, and you see what's going on there. You know, I'm an adult. I'm not gonna pick up this bottle and throw it against the wall and glass gonna get everywhere and kids are gonna cut their, I'm, I'm an adult, I'm a, it's Australia Day. It would be un-Australian for me not to have a beer on today. And you just kind of look, you realize what the law says and you know you're not supposed to kind of drink uh, in that place, but really it's just the law and who's being heard anyway? The Irish backpackers, they're drinking and uh, Waverley Council, they need to change their rules. This is unfair, heavy handed, this is draconian. And so, you know, yeah, it might be wrong, but it's not the end of the world. That's a legal paradigm. But you contrast that with a relate, you know, it's, it's wrong, but it's not awful. Now you contrast, here's the relational paradigm. A man woos a girl and he loves her when no one else would. She's shy, she's awkward, but he loves her in such a way that she grows in confidence and she begins to blossom into someone who is very attractive and she falls in love with the one who has loved her so much and given her so much that she determines to marry him. And on the morning of their wedding with the newfound confidence and the glow of love that has been showed her, she's now flourishing. And in that confidence and love, on the way to the wedding, what does she do? She seduces the best man and has sex with him in the bridal car before going into the service to marry her new husband. Now, when you hear that, that's not just wrong. That, that's a, it's awful. It's ludicrous. And why it's not just wrong but awful, it's because it's not just breaking a law. It's betraying a relationship at the deepest level. And that's a relational paradigm. And that's what the Bible says we do when we sin. Sin is spiritual adultery. It's not just breaking a law, it's breaking God's heart. And we are Goma, whether you're a man or a woman, and God is Hosea. And this is the story we need to tell about ourselves. We've run after other lovers and left God behind. And yet he keeps loving us, pursuing us, wooing us. And yet we keep rejecting him. So thirdly, uh, if we've looked at how our relationship with God is like a marriage, secondly, it's like a broken marriage. Thirdly, well, what does God do about this broken marriage and what does it cost him? Because actually the story of the whole Bible, uh, this is the story of the whole Bible. Just as marriage is like our relationship with God, just as Homer's, Hosea's marriage is like ours with God, so what Hosea will do is what God will do for his people. So what does Hosea do about this wife who keeps having affairs? Well, look back, chapter 3, verse 1. Come back now to chapter 3, verse 1, and here is the solution. The Lord said to Hosea, go and show your love to your wife again. She's left him. She's up for sale. And God says, go again. He's saying, you've got a thousand reasons for divorce, but I want you to go get her anyway. Don't divorce. Go get her. Show her, show the world what I am like to my bride go to her and he does in verse 2 so Hosea bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley now here's what's happened in in um in Israel in the 8th century BC where Hosea is the society has decayed culturally to the point where it was pretty much like every other pagan nation and there's very good chance that you know slavery is part of their society now it shouldn't have been but it is and um, it's very possible, probable, that this is a public auction and Goma is being auctioned as a slave in the marketplace. And we all know that she was probably either stripped naked or she's virtually naked because the bidders had to see what they were getting. She's up for sale and the bidding starts. And it's hard to imagine 
that she wouldn't have had her eyes closed as the only kind of the last shield of protection against those who are before her. And as she's there in inner degradation, she hears the voices and she hears five shekels, eight shekels, 10 shekels. And she begins to realize that one of the voices is her husband. And she's thinking, what's he doing here? After all I've done, what's he doing here? 10, 12, 13, 15, 15 shekels of silver and a lethek of barley or a homer of barley. Sold. Sold to Hosea. And he would have come up and she would have been thinking, what is he doing? And he would have come up and he would have covered her nakedness with her cloak and led her away. And she must have been saying, why would he still want me. Oh, I get it. Revenge. Now you can do with me whatever you want. You own me now. But verse 3 says no. He speaks tenderly to her. He tells her, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I'll behave the same way towards you. He's saying, I want to dwell with you. I don't want you to live as a slave. I want you back as my wife. I want to rebuild our lives together and our home together. I want to live with you. He wants reconciliation. He wants the relationship renewed. He covers her shame. And notice that can only come by him paying a ransom price. He pays a price, not just financially. He's paid an enormous price socially culturally when his friends hear what he's done they're going to laugh at him you've taken her back after all she's done to you so he's paying a price financially socially culturally even emotionally he swallows the pain he doesn't make her pay he pays and this is one of the greatest parables of God's love anywhere in the Bible in fact James Montgomery Boyce one of the great Bible teachers of the 20 20th century said this is the greatest chapter in the entire Bible because it shows us the the lengths to which God's love will come and reach us and the depths that he will go to lift us out and so he wins us a great gospel to himself and he redeems her and that's the way God's love works Hosea loves and it costs and what price would God pay for us well it's the same you know in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus asked the question, why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus replies, do the friends of the bridegroom fast when they're with the bridegroom? Very interesting statement. Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom. And if you're an Israelite, you know, no, God's the bridegroom of Israel. And so Jesus is making a claim to be God here in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus is saying, I am the bridegroom. I've come to rescue the bride. And, and, and then he says, I'm the bridegroom. When I'm here, they don't fast. But when I go away to the cross, that's the day that they will fast. And then in Ma Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, the son of man, which is the way he speaks about himself, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to ransom the many. So in Jesus Christ, God enters the world. He goes to the marketplace and he sees those who are held in captivity by the foolish mistakes they had made and he comes and he ransoms them by the payment of a price. And of course, the price he paid for your freedom was his own life and death. And so he pays the price and then he comes up to you with a robe of his righteousness to cover over your sin and shame so that before God you are acceptable, righteous, um, justified before God. Jesus Christ, that's what he's done for you. This chapter, this story, it's a picture of what's wrong with us. But it's also a picture of God's great love for those who've cheated on him. It's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. Jesus doesn't just offer us to the world as an example. He shows himself to be someone who rescues us from, his, from our sins. 
He died that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Do you know his love for you like that? In what ways have you been ignoring his love and cheating on him? Turn. Make the decision to make him a priority in your life. Repent of your adultery and come back to his love. Admit, I can't deliver myself from this heart that is so prone to wander. God, come and save me. I need the grace of God. You know, there's that wonderful hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's true of us, isn't it? If you say that to him, he'll come and he'll rescue you. I want to finish with a, a fairy tale. Um, it's an old Scottish fairy tale uh, called The Black Bull of Norway. I originally heard it in someone's sermon and then tracked it down and, and listened to it. And it's about a prince who goes into battle and he kills someone and he's filled with guilt. And when he goes home, he can't get the blood out of his tunic, a sign that he that he feels guilt and he can't get the guilt out of his life. And when he goes home, he can't get the blood out of his tunic and he makes this statement to his city, if there's any girl, any young woman in this kingdom who can get the stain out of my tunic, then I'll know she's my true love and I'll marry her and she'll be my queen. And all the variety of girls in the kingdom come and try and get the stain out of his tunic, but no one can. And there's this Cinderella type girl in the story who's kind of a slave and she works for this evil stepmother uh, who's got her own daughters and the girl doesn't know about the promise doesn't know about the challenge and one day she just sees the tunic lying on the ground she washes it and it, and it comes back clean and the and the prince is like who did this and the evil stepmother takes um uh she says one of my daughters did it and she gives one of the evil stepdaughter one of the one of the daughters to the prince but the prince realizes that no 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 it's not one of them and he keeps working it no 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 who who did this and he discovers who it really was that got the stain out and he marries her and that was his true love the message is that the one who is able to get the stain out is your true love and that's what Jesus does for the world he's come to rescue the world to remove the stain of guilt and sin and the way the Bible describes that is of a lover who comes and rescues his adulterous bride from the slave market. And that's what Jesus does. He comes and he rescues us and he gets the stain out of our lives. He clothes our sin, our shame, our defilement, and he bears the price himself. And that's proof that he is the true lover that we need. He can redeem your past. He can cleanse your heart of any stain. Everybody needs that. We are Goma. God is Hosea. And he married us even when we we're unclean. He knew that we would prove unfaithful again and again. And he knew we would forsake him. And yet he still loved us and purchased us. And he transforms us day by day. A white pastor view of God says, oh, he accepts you, he affirms everything you do. You can do nothing that's wrong before God. No, the Bible says he is jealous for your love. Not because he needs you, but because he's chosen to love you and enter a relationship with you. You benefit from his love. And so if you're a Christian, maybe you haven't run so far from God as Gomer has from Hosea, but if you're like me, you've been half-hearted in your love and you have disgraced his name in small ways, if not in large ones. And you ought to come back to him, flee to Jesus, lie in his arms, tell him of your love and don't continue in disobedience and in your spiritual adulteries. And if you're not yet following Jesus and you've never known a love like this, why don't you continue to look into it and see if it really exists? You can have a part of this. It is possible for you to be loved by God in this way. It is for people like you and me that Jesus died. And if you're touched by this story and you sense that Christ died for you, 
then don't let your thoughts of your own inadequacy hold you back. Run to Jesus. Believe in him. And know for certain that his love is as strong as this story teaches you. Let me pray. Father God, please enrich our view of your love as we come to terms with the ludicrous nature of our sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.